Good evening, folks. Uh, we'll get started. I, can the, those of you in the back, can you hear me clearly? Okay, perfect. Um, so first of all, I wanted to thank everybody for coming out tonight uh, on a Monday night and um, attending this uh, session. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Siraj Jamani. I'm a neurosurgeon by trade. And uh, I'm also the director of the spine program here at Casa Colina. My uh, seminar is titled Spine Surgery 101. Um, and that's really because um, I wanted to take uh, this evening to really just take, uh, you know, take some time to sort of shed some uh, light about what spine surgery involves. We'll go through some terms, we'll go through some uh, technicalities and, um, you know, hopefully answer any questions that you may have at the end. And we will have a question and answer session at the end for anybody who'd want to ask any additional questions. Perfect. So, um, you know, the, the idea of surgery can often be very daunting uh, to, to a patient. Uh, the idea of going under anesthesia to go under the knife. And so a lot of what, you know, uh, folks know about surgery usually comes from TV shows and movies. And so, you know, we often have a lot of misconceptions about uh, what it involves. Like, I don't think I've ever seen a, an operating theater with people in the background watching. And, you know, famous uh, Seinfeld scene, you know, where uh, I think a lot of you uh, know. Um, but um, as I said, I wanted to kind of take some time to just shed some light, specifically when it comes to doing surgery on the spine. So just to kind of run through some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight, first what I'll do is I'll just kind of define some terms that we use regarding spine issues or spine ailments. Uh, number two is I'll go and summarize some of the common procedures that we typically do for the spine and give you kind of a general idea. Uh, three is we'll discuss what can be done uh, to ensure the highest rate of success if you are uh, found to be a surgical candidate. And then uh, we'll kind of just outline the process about what it in, uh, what's involved when you are uh, told that you need surgery. And lastly, I'll just kind of touch up on our spine program here at Casa Colina and see how it might, you know, potentially help you or a loved one or a friend who may uh, who, who may benefit. Uh, so first of all, let's kind of just talk about a little bit of anatomy. I think understanding the spine uh, it helps to know anatomically what the spine is. So to be clear, when I'm talking about the spine, I'm actually talking about the bones of the spine. So these are all the bones that provide structural support to our body. And the spine really has two, uh, two uh, functions. Number one is it provides a, a structural support for us to allow us to stand and walk and move. And number two is the spine actually protects the spinal cord, which is a very important um, a bundle of nervous tissue that allows the brain to communicate with the rest of the body. And so uh, uh, the spine forms a canal around this that protects the spinal cord and then uh, uh, and, and is in a way that still provides us with structural support. So when we talk about the spine, we really divide it in segments. Um, and you may have you know, heard these terms before, cervical being the neck, uh, thoracic being the mid-back or the upper spine lumbar which is uh, the lower back and then the sacrum is the lowest part of the spine that attaches to the pelvis and lastly we talk about the coccyx which is actually your tailbone that's actually part of the spine and it's several fused segments uh, there so these are the segments that we talk about most commonly when i see patients in my office usually people have issues of either the cervical or the lumbar spine and the reason why is because those are the parts of the spine that tend to move the most we have the ability to twist and bend of our lower back. Also with our necks, we're you know, turning and twisting our neck. Our thoracic area does not move as much, and it's not to say that there cannot be issues there, but because of the fact that it's stabilized by the ribs, the rib cage, there isn't as much movement, and generally we don't see it as many issues there. Same thing with the sacrum and the coccyx. Because they're actually fused vertebra, there isn't really uh, very much movement, so it's very rare that we see issues there. So I wanted to kind of go into some of the terms that we talk about. Uh, number one is the term stenosis. What does stenosis mean? Stenosis really means a narrowing of a certain part. We use that, for example, in the heart. We use that in vascular issues. And specifically in the spine, we talk about stenosis of the spine, which means narrowing of the area in the spine where the spinal cord or the nerves are traveling. And so stenosis can sometimes occur right along the middle of the, uh, of the spine, um, and that narrowing can uh, potentially 
compromise the spinal cord. We also talk about stenosis of the foramen. So these are the small openings on the side of the spine where the nerves are traveling, where the nerves are exiting. And so, um, and these can, of course, lead to issues for which you would seek uh, medical care or medical attention. Uh, number two is I wanted to talk about a common term that everyone, I think, is familiar with, with the, which is sciatica. Sciatica is uh, defined as pain that often starts in the back and travels down into the leg. Now, one common misnomer that a lot of people have is that sciatica does, have, does not have anything to do with the sciatic nerve. Um, a lot of times people say, well, it's my sciatic nerve. And the answer is, no, it's not your sciatic nerve. You have sciatica. And the reason why it's called that way is because the sciatic nerve travels in that sort of pattern or distribution that sciatica occurs. But sciatica essentially means pain that starts in the lower back or buttock region and will travel down into the leg. And depending on which nerve is affected, that pattern can be different. So sometimes it can travel in the front of the leg. Sometimes it can travel in the outside of the leg. And sometimes it goes down into the back of the leg, all the way down into the foot. But that's the term sciatica. The other term we talk about is radiculopathy. So radiculopathy is more of the technical term. And radiculopathy refers to impingement of a nerve at the level of the spine. So nerves that get impinged, you know, nerves really carry three functions. Number one is they provide uh, innervation to our muscles, so they have a motor aspect of them. Number two is they provide uh, a sensation, so it allows you to feel things. And lastly, pain. Pain is actually in some ways a, an advantageous uh, a, a sensation because that's your body's way of telling you something is wrong, something is going on. And so what happens when patients have radiculopathy, they can often have one or more of these three symptoms of either pain, numbness, or weakness. And certainly, depending on where that nerve is impinged, that can affect you know, a different body parts. So in the neck, those nerves go to the arms. So a radiculopathy of the neck or a cervical radiculopathy can cause pain, weakness, numbness of the arm versus a lumbar radiculopathy, which can cause pain, numbness, or weakness of the leg. Neuropathy. So radiculopathy, we differentiate from neuropathy because neuropathy is a problem with a peripheral nerve, meaning it's a problem with the nerve after it's exited or after it's left the spine. So for example, one very common you know, term we hear is diabetic neuropathy. What's diabetic neuropathy? Diabetic neuropathy is inflammation of the peripheral nerves, meaning the nerves of the hands or feet, and those nerves uh, get inflamed after you know, years and years and years of having uncontrolled diabetes. And so that can often present with weakness, numbness, pain of the hands and the feet. It usually follows a stocking and glove distribution. Uh, one other common form of neuropathy is carpal tunnel syndrome. So carpal tunnel syndrome really means pinching of the nerve of the wrist, called the median nerve. And a lot of people, for example, who work with their hands a lot, whether they're working on computers or mechanics or people who do a lot of repetitive ta you know, movements with their hands are, are often uh, uh, affected by carpal tunnel syndrome. And so they get pain or numbness in their hand as a, as a result. And there are many forms of neuropathy. I'm just kind of highlighting a few examples of those. Um, and that's, um, you know, that's the difference between a radiculopathy, which is really at the level of the spine. Scoliosis. Uh, so scoliosis is also another common term. Um, uh, and that refers to an abnormality in the curvature of the spine. And we talk about that in both the coronal and the sagittal plane. Now, what do I mean by that? Coronal plane mean, means if I'm facing you, how does my spine look? Is my spine straight? Does my spine curve to one side or another? Versus the sagittal plane is my profile. So how do I look now if, I'm look, if, if, I, if you're looking at me from the side? And that's really important. And we, talk, we think about scoliosis as typically two types. Uh, so we see what we probably are more familiar with, which is adolescent scoliosis, and that's scoliosis that affects children, usually in their uh, teenage years, and that's because they have scoliosis, they hit the growth spurt, and that scoliosis can sometimes get worse as they grow. And then there is a different type, which I deal with more often, which is adult onset scoliosis. 
And believe it or not, adult onset scoliosis, the alignment in the sagittal plane is really what's essential. Meaning, when I look at you from the side, how does your head line up with your pelvis? Are you bending forward or are you standing up straight? You know, it doesn't matter to me. If you're looking at me straight and we get an x-ray and I see that your spine is shaped like an S, that's not, to me, the big issue because we know we've done studies that have shown that in adults, that's not the problem. The problem is how your back looks like in the sagittal plane, how you look like from your side profile, and that's usually what we achieve to fix or correct when we're talking about adult scoliosis surgery. Spondylolisthesis. Spondylolisthesis refers to slippage or shifting of the spine. So that means that the spine shifts relative to a, uh, another part or another segment. Normally when we look at the spine, it's all in well alignment. And so what happens because of weakening of the surrounding structure, such as the muscles and the ligaments, sometimes this can occur as a result of trauma. Sometimes it can be congenital. You could be born with an abnormality where you're missing a small segment of bone that predisposes you to getting this. The problem with spondylolisthesis when you have a slipped disc is that this can often lead to pain, just back pain, if it occurs in the lower back. This, is all, this can also occur in the neck as well. But number two is it can pinch the nerves off in your lower back and lead to sciatica or a, a radiculopathy. And this is something that we, you know, when we evaluate and we assess, we determine whether or not uh, surgery is the right answer. So what is spine surgery? Um, the goal of spine surgery is often to decompress the neural elements, also known as the spinal cord and the nerves, and to stabilize a segment of the spine. And I say often because certainly there are other reasons to be doing spine surgery, but that's the most common reason. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of times patients come to me and see me in my office with back pain thinking that surgery is going to be the right answer. And I tell them this, and I say this here, that most patients do not need spine surgery. Most patients do not need back surgery. Uh, and it's really a, a small segment that have uh, anatomic issues, as we talked about, along with symptoms, and have failed conservative treatments. Uh, uh, those are the patients who often are the best candidates for, for surgery. Um, and we do surgery for a number of different causes. Most commonly, it's because of uh, uh, degenerative issues. That just really means you know, age-related uh, wear and tear. Uh, and I always kind of, uh, in my office, I like to use the example of uh, a car, right? The more you drive a car, the wheels need to be changed, tires need to be changed, brakes need to be changed, right? So that's what happens to our bodies over time. And you can do things to try to maintain it, to prevent these things from getting worse. And, 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 and that's, you know, I think uh, a key, you know, to try to preserve yourself as much as possible. Now, other reasons we do surgery include things like trauma, things like tumors or cancers that affect the spine, and also congenital abnormalities, uh, things that patients are often uh, born with that can affect them either early or even later on in life. Um, so uh, we talked about some of these terms. Conditions that may require surgery are things such as spinal stenosis, a herniated disc, spondylolisthesis, scoliosis. And these are you know, the, the surgical uh, uh, treatment or the surgical approach um, usually uh, depends on you know, what the pathology is, the symptoms as well as you know the, the patient and that's you know something that I would urge you to discuss you know with your surgeon and or you know your primary physician as well about you know you know whether or not they feel like you're a, a candidate for surgery if that you know is the case um, so I'm going to go through some of the procedures um, that we uh, commonly do in some terms and I'm just really hoping to um, shed some light on you know what these terms mean as you, you may hear them uh, so the first one is a laminectomy, and so what a laminectomy is is removal of the lamina. So the lamina is essentially the roof of the spine or the spine you know, of the spinal canal. So it's kind of the top part that houses these nerves or the spinal cord, and it's usually done to decompress the spinal cord or the or the nerves, um, and it often spares the moving parts of the spine, meaning it often spares the areas of uh, the spine that are involved in motion or mobility. And one question I commonly get is, 
well, doc, if I get a laminectomy, aren't you removing a part of my spine? Isn't that going to weaken my spine? Um, and, and the answer is kind of uh, complicated, but I say yes and no. Um, you know, and I always like to use the analogy of a room, right? This room right now, if I took the roof off this room, the room is still going to stay standing. It's not going to collapse on itself. Now, if I took one of the walls out, then the room may potentially be compromised. And so the lamina, I look at it as the roof of the room. So it's the top part of the room. And in, that, in, in the spine, you know, it's, it's the area that is housing the spinal canal, the nerves. And so what we do is we're trying to create more space, more room for the nerves by removing part of that in order to, to decompress. Um, so this is kind of just a, a few diagrams to show you um, this example. So what we're doing here is we're looking on the bottom, we're looking at the spine in cross section. This is the, bot the front right here. And this is the back. That's actually the part known as the spinous process. So when you're feeling the middle of your back, that's the part of your spine that you're feeling. And so this right here is your spinal canal. So you can see there's a cross section of the spinal cord. And this area right here is the lamina. So that's kind of the roof that's covering the lamina. And so showing you just before and after a, a laminectomy, you see how you know, this kind of, you know, the diagram is illustrating how that area can be really tight. And after the laminectomy, that area is opened up and freed up. So more room is created so that the nerves are not being decompressed. Um, and then this is just now a view from behind the spine. So you're looking at it essentially from the back of the spine and how that part gets removed. And now you've got uh, an opening uh, where the, 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 the nerves are. Uh, the next term I wanted to talk about is a discectomy, a term you, you may have heard as a discectomy. And it could be a lumbar discectomy, it could be a cervical discectomy, depending on uh, which part of the spine we're talking about. Now, a discectomy is removing a part of a disc, or what I coin as shaving down a part of the disc that has herniated, that has come out and is now pushing on the spine, whether it be the nerves or whether it be the spinal cord. Um, and uh, with, a, um, you know, with a discectomy, it does require making sort of a window or an opening into the spine, so creating an opening by removing a part of the bone. Um, when we do a discectomy, we generally try to preserve as much of the disc as possible. And the reason why is because you need your disc for structural support. I'm not here trying to remove the entire disc. Um, but what happens is when a portion of the inner part of the disc pushes out, that can cause pain, it can cause you know, sciatica, uh, radiculopathy, the things that we talked about. Um, you know, what happens is the disc really has two, two parts, and I think I have it, yeah, right here. So, you know, this is kind of a, another cross-sectional view, just giving you an idea of what a disc can do. So, a disc has two parts. You have an outer fibrous ring right here, and you have an inner soft center. I like to use the uh, example of like a jelly donut. You know, you have the jelly donut, you have the outer donut, and you have the inner jelly. So, what happens is, when you get a weakening in that outer donut, uh, outer donut, that inner jelly uh, squirts out. And so that inner jelly being the softer part of the disc pushes out. And I hear it all the time, you know, patients say, well, you know, I was just moving some furniture and I picked something up and I twist and all of a sudden I had this sharp pain. And the next day I couldn't get out of bed because I had severe back pain, I had severe leg pain. Uh, and that's usually a, um, a triggering sort of episode. Now. There are some people who tell me, hey, Doc, I just woke up and I had this pain, or this just kind of came on you know, suddenly and I didn't really do anything. And that can happen, and that's just you know, with time, you know, with chronic wear and tear. Usually when we see disc herniations, they often occur in the lower part of the back, in the lumbar spine. And you think about it, that's the area that has to carry the most weight. And so you know, with all that pressure you know, of your upper body weight, over time, these discs can be get, can get compromised and eventually give way, and that's and that's really what can uh, cause problems or issues. Um, so the next uh, procedure I want to talk about is a, a foraminotomy, um, and so what a foraminotomy is, it's really uh, an, uh, uh, trying to open up the foramen. So the foramen is the small openings in the spine where the nerves are actually exiting or leaving. So, you know, you think about the foramen as being the off ramps when you're driving on the freeway, you know, you're going down the 10 freeway, you know, you got all these exits, you know, coming off. Those foramen are those exits where the nerves are trying to leave 
and go to a certain part of the body, whether it be your arm, whether it be your leg. Uh, and so what a foraminotomy really is doing is trying to open up that space, that specific space, and create more room for the nerve. Now, spinal fusion, um, and this is a very um, broad term, um, I will say, um, re uh, really involves stabilizing a portion or a segment of the spine, usually by placement of some kind of hardware or instrumentation. Now, the approaches are very, uh, very you know, varied and uh, different, and it really depends on several factors, including which part of the spine is affected, depends on your anatomy, um, you know, believe it or not, we all have different anatomy, and so your anatomy can be unique, uh, and that can potentially influence the approach that your doctor, your surgeon chooses to make. Um, and it can also uh, 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 be dependent on the pathology, the problem at hand, and what needs to be fixed. And so that approach can be done from the front, that can be done from the side, that can be done from the back, and th those approaches, you know, all um, have advantages and disadvantages, and you know that's something that I would definitely implore you to uh, to talk to your you know your surgeon about if that is ever the case. Um, and I've given just some of the many many examples of uh, 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 hardware or instrumentations uh, that you see in the spine. You know we often see screws in the you know in the spine. They're known as pedicle screws because they traverse part of the spine known as the pedicle. Uh, and these are connected with rods. You can sometimes see uh, spacers and cages and plates. And there's all kinds of, you know, uh, gear and, you know, tools that we use, uh, you know, that can, you know, sometimes make somebody look like a bionic, you know, man or woman. Um, and, and so, um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, 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 tools out there. And certainly, you know, not everybody um, is a candidate for a spinal fusion. It all sort of depends on your general health. It's all very dependent on um, the integrity and the, and the structure of your bone. What I always tell patients is that when I'm putting in hardware in someone's spine, the hardware is really meant to be a placeholder. The true strength of a fusion comes from your bone's ability to grow and heal over time. And so that process can take six months to a year and sometimes even longer. And so what happens is some patients run into the issue of non-union or non-fusion, meaning the bones don't set, the bones don't grow over time. Uh, and, and so that can be a problem, and, and, and it can be a problem where it can lead to pain, it can you know, lead to maybe future subsequent surgeries. Uh, the things that you do to try to prevent that or avoid that is eliminating those risk factors that can you know, lead to that. So that includes things like cigarette smoking. That's one very uh, uh, common uh, problem. Uh, there are patients who have low bone density. You may have heard the term osteopenia or osteoporosis, meaning your bones are not as dense as they should be compared to the average person your age. And that can certainly be a risk factor as well. So these are all things to, to discuss and you know, potentially have checked out prior to you know, moving forward with, uh, with something like this. Um, so, you know, the question you may ask is, well, okay, I'm getting spine surgery. What's, what's next? What do I do? How, you know, what are the, what are the next step? Um, you know, I always tell, you know, my patients, you should consult with your PCP, your cardiologist, if you see one, your pulmonologist, because, you know, what you want to do is make sure that your general health is as optimized as possible. And the reason why is because surgery always potentially carries risk. And, you know, although we don't, uh, uh, expect anything bad to happen, it can happen. And so you want to do everything you can in your part to make sure that you are as healthy as possible because the stronger you are going into surgery, the stronger you are coming out of surgery. So, you know, and, and nobody knows your health better than your own PCP and they can kind of give you a, a, a more informed decision. You know, we talked about the issue of smoking. So those, you know, those who do smoke, trying to quit smoking, um, you know, among all the, 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 the bad things that smoking, cigarette smoking can, can lead to, um, it, it does affect healing of the spine. It does affect bony fusion, as we talked about. Uh, it does affect you know, your ability to you know, be put under anesthesia and to be put to sleep for a procedure. So trying to quit. 
Um, losing weight, I think, is 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 is, is essential. Um, and you know, I tell all my patients this, and that's because you know, as I talked about, um, the lower back especially has to carry most of your upper body weight. And so, trying to lose weight not only um, makes the surgery uh, uh, easier for me as your surgeon, but makes it safer for you as a patient, makes the recovery that much better. And, 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 and a lot of times uh, I've seen many, 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 many examples of patients who you know, come to me with some kind of spine ailment and I say, listen, I, I think you need surgery, but you need to lose weight first, you know, simply because I just don't think it's safe. And I've had a lot of patients who, you know, who are determined, you know, push themselves, do what they can, you know, whether it's dieting, whether it's exercise, or a combination of everything, and they lose weight, and they come to me, and they say, you know what, Doc, I'm actually feeling a lot better. I, I don't think I need this surgery, and I, I can't tell you how many uh, patients I've seen you know, that way who've, who've come back to me, you know, months later who, 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 who are, you know, doing a lot better, uh, and so a lot of times we see that, and so, and I know, um, you know, one thing I, I hear is, hey, I, I, can't, I can't move, I can't exercise, I can't function because I'm in so much pain. I can't, you know, do the things that I need to do to lose weight. And I, and I understand that. Um, I'm not certainly faulting anyone, um, but doing everything we can in our power to ensure that, you know, we have the best success, I think, is, is, is key. Um, and then lastly, I talk about reducing narcotic usage. And that's, um, you know, I think that's very essential. Um, for some of our patients who are uh, uh, chronic pain patients, um, who have chronic back pain, who have chronic neck pain. And the reason why is because opioids are often used to control the pain. The problem with opioid usage is that your body has receptors that these opioid medications specifically target or specifically work on. And what happens is the longer you're taking these medications, those receptors get saturated, meaning you need to have higher and higher doses of opioids to achieve the same effect. And so um, what makes my job difficult as a surgeon is if I have a patient who's a chronic opioid user, is controlling your pain after surgery becomes very, very difficult because your body's so used to having high doses of medications that you know the pain uh, after surgery can often be worse than the pain that you had before surgery. And so that's why I tell everyone, do what you can to try to reduce, you know, opioids uh, if possible, uh, and that way it makes our, our, our jobs a lot easier. Not only that, but, you know, opioids just, you know, they have bad side effects. I mean, they're addictive. They constipate you. They, you know, they do, they do other things that, you know, can affect you. And so, you know, we, 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 we generally, you know, use them in kind of in very uh, specific roles, and, and in fact, the, the, the usage of uh, opioids has actually fallen out of favor, or now, as physicians, it's very highly regulated, the prescription of opioids. You know, pharmacies are, are looking over these prescriptions because of, you know, the issues that, that, that we've had. So trying to reduce it certainly makes, uh, makes our jobs and our lives a lot easier. Um, so here at Casa Colina, we have a spine program that was established uh, about three, uh, four year, uh, three to four years ago. And um, what we're trying to do is take a multidisciplinary approach uh, uh, to uh, uh, addressing issues or ailments of the spine. Um, we have phenomenal physicians, whether it's our physiatry uh, uh, colleagues, whether it's our pain management specialists or our surgeons. And so uh, what the Casa Colina Spine Program is really a team of uh, neurosurgeons, physiatrists, and pain management, and we work hand in hand to uh, try to give that sort of comprehensive approach uh, to patients with regards to those who are dealing with spine ailments. Um, um, nurse navigator, right now we're, we're in transition, but we, are, uh, we do normally have a nurse navigator who helps you as a patient navigate the system because oftentimes as a patient, it can be daunting to try to figure out, well, who do I go to? Where do I go get this test? Where do I you know, do this study? What's next? And so our, our, our staff and our nurse navigators try to help kind of ease that uh, process for you and just make it a very, uh, very patient-friendly process. Uh, we do offer a pre-op spine class, which I think is phenomenal, and I do encourage anybody who, you know, you know, if you ever end up needing spine surgery to go attend that class because it really kind of gives you a much more detailed rundown of what to expect, you know, before surgery, during surgery, after surgery, and how to ensure that you have the most success. 
Um, and there's just access to, you know, to a lot of resources through our programs, through our website, and just the kind of overall sort of guidance through the process. Um, and so we're, we're, you know, we're fortunate to be here in this, you know, in this, in this uh, hospital, in this facility with such great resources. Um, so, uh, you know, I wanted to thank everybody for, uh, you know, listening to my talk.